Human beings aren't really made to survive at really high altitudes, but that hasn't stopped many people over the years to try and conquer the mighty Everest, our planet's highest peak above sea level. The mountain is 29,031 feet tall and is a place of icy temperatures and limited oxygen. It's not exactly a hospitable place for living things, and once they get there, people's bodies are in serious trouble. Despite the danger, year after year, people continue to study and train for the mountain's rigors and take on the challenge. If you're thinking about making the climb, one of the first things you should do is consult a physician to evaluate your physical health. That way, you can discover any pre-existing conditions that might be amplified by high altitude. If you're serious about climbing Everest, you'll need to train your cardio rather than your strength. The elevation at Everest Base Camp is 17,590 feet, which decreases oxygen by about 50%. Before attempting a May summit, it's recommended that you arrive at Base Camp towards the beginning of April to acclimatize for a few weeks. There's even an Everest Base Camp Medical Clinic founded in 2003, so you'll be in good hands if you run into any problems. They treat everything from high-altitude cough and acute mountain sickness to frostbite. They even treat multiple sprained or broken ankles due to the rocky terrain. High-altitude cough and acute mountain sickness are common ailments among Everest climbers. Mountain sickness results in headaches and shortness of breath, but can be managed by ascending no more than 1,000 feet a day. Unfortunately, no one is immune to high-altitude cough. Climbers know to expect the shock of excessively cold temperatures and the possibility of frostbite as they ascend Everest, but they might not be prepared for the other extreme, heat. Surprising, right? On Everest, the snow and ice act as a giant reflector of the sun's glare, so the potential for sunburn is particularly great in certain areas. Food plays a major role on how your body reacts to being on Everest. In some cases, as you climb higher and higher, digestion can slow down so much that your body can't send nutrients to the muscles anymore. It's best to eat small meals before ascending to different camps. Consuming too much food at once will send all of the blood towards the stomach to aid in digestion, which could redirect it from the other functions of the body at altitude. At higher altitudes, your body begins craving more sugars and it becomes harder to digest protein. That's why climbers usually rely on plain noodles, canned vegetables and meats. But where did this whole climbing Mount Everest challenge come from? Let me tell you the story of the beekeeper from New Zealand who, along with his buddy, became the first people to stand atop of the world's tallest peak. His name was Edmund Hillary, and he had already been climbing with British teams in the Himalayas in the early 1950s. Then, in 1953, they got invited to join a new Everest expedition. And guess what? On May 29th of that year, Hillary made it to the tippy top of Mount Everest via the Southeast Ridge. The media went wild over Hillary's achievement and they were invited to all sorts of fancy events and packed halls to give lectures. But Hillary didn't let the fame go to his head. In fact, he used it as an opportunity to do some good in the world. He went on to lead a jet boat expedition up the Ganges River. But perhaps most impressively, he returned to the Himalayas in the 1960s to help build schools and health facilities. Despite all his accomplishments and awards, including a portrait of New Zealand's $5 note, Hillary remained a humble dude until the end. I mean, sure, it's a really high mountain, and the altitude surely causes problems to most people. But is Mount Everest actually the toughest mountain to climb? That may be partially a myth. For experienced climbers, it's not technically difficult. It's like a long, slow, plodding ascent, or what climbers call a walk-up. So, it's no surprise that some guides have climbed it 15 times, 
while some locals have even climbed it a mind-boggling 21 times. Now don't get me wrong, Everest is still a formidable opponent. But did you know that there are other mountains that are even tougher? Like K2, the second highest peak in the world, or Mount Nupsi, which is right next to Everest. That little guy may not be as famous as its giant neighbor, but it's consistently steep and offers few safe places to camp. Just in case you're ready for climbing and are already packing your bags, let's clear up a little misconception. You don't actually have to endure years of preparation if you want to conquer Mount Everest. The Nepalese officials don't require a specific number of training hours before you attempt the climb. You will need to get a permit beforehand though, which can be pretty expensive. However, if you want to increase your chances of success and make the most of your experience, you might want to consider some training. Just be prepared to invest in some of the trekking agencies in Nepal, who offer different kinds of training programs. And before you even set foot in Nepal, it's important to commit to a heightened exercise schedule several months before your climb. You may want to be in tip-top shape for this once-in-a-lifetime adventure. If you do decide to go, you can also schedule some time with a guide, preferably one that's been on Everest many times. They can help you with a screening and design a training program to help you prepare for the journey. All in all, you don't need to be a superhuman with years of training under your belt to climb Mount Everest. But a little preparation never hurt anyone and it might just make your adventure even more amazing. Not to mention, it can prevent you from experiencing rookie accidents right there on the spot. Some people out there do, however, come with some built-in features that help them to better withstand high altitudes. Did you know that Sherpas and Quechua are some of the most amazing high-altitude dwellers out there? These folks have been living above 14,000 feet for generations and they've adapted to the thin air in ways that make Mount Everest look like a stroll in the park. Well, maybe not exactly, but you get the idea. One of the coolest things about these Highlanders is that they have superhuman respiratory capacity in conditions with less oxygen. That means they can get oxygen to their muscles more efficiently than those of us who live closer to sea level. Of course, there are still some questions that need to be answered. We don't know for sure if this adaptation has really increased the fitness of these populations. And it's possible the enhanced capacity is just a side effect of something else that that particular gene does. But it's still pretty cool to think about how these folks evolved to thrive in some of the harshest conditions on the planet. Then there's the Sherpa gene. These amazing folks that live in the high mountain region of the eastern Himalaya have a special genetic variation that allows them to thrive in high-altitude environments. The EPAS1 gene, also known as the Sherpa gene, helps regulate the production of hemoglobin, which allows the body to work more efficiently with less oxygen. So while the rest of us are huffing and puffing up those steep slopes, the Sherpas are practically skipping up the mountainside. Now, you may have been wondering if you have the Sherpa gene. Well, unless you have a Sherpa parent, it's unlikely. But even if you don't have the gene, studying the genetics of the Sherpas could lead to important medical breakthroughs. Scientists are already learning how the body responds to low oxygen environments, which could help patients with critical illness and brain injuries in the future. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.